he said to me, what's the single most important thing that really feels different? I wouldn't say it is central bank constraint. For any mix of assets that you're holding, it's been a huge one in the back that every time things go wrong and the risk premium start expanding and things start going down and have a wealth of bank, central banks can say, let me go solve that problem. But all of this is under the assumption, one environment, which is central bank sees a problem, solves it. Bro falls, they can solve it. Now they look extremely constrained in most countries around the world, as constrained as they haven't looked into up 70s, simple for reason that they want more than they can have. They want multiple things at once that just can't coexist. I'm Jim Haskell, editor of the Bridgewater Daily Observations. Our listeners might remember our podcast a little while back with Ray Dalio and Jeremy Grantham, and that was co-moderated by one of our clients and friends, co-CIO of Evoke Advisors, Alex Shahidi. Recently, as part of this year's Advisor Perspectives Investment Insights Summit, Alex had the opportunity to sit down with Bridgewater co-CIO for sustainability, Karen Carnell tambor And we're sharing an edited version of that conversation in today's Daily Observations because we really thought it was quite good. You'll hear Karen describe why she thinks we're in a new era of persistently higher inflation, how investors can prepare their portfolios for this new environment, as well as the short-term and long-term challenges facing Europe due to higher energy prices. Karen also talks through some of the pitfalls of the current efforts to tackle climate change and create a clean energy transition. And she also shares thoughts on the state of ESG investing. So with that, let's get right into the conversation with Karen Carnell tambor and Alex Shahidi. Hi, everyone. I'm Alex Shahidi, co-CIO of Evoke Advisors, which is a large RIA in Los Angeles. And one of my core responsibilities as co-CIO is to identify investment managers we can find to allocate our client uh, assets to. And about 15 plus years ago, I came across Bridgewater, uh, which is the largest hedge fund in the world. And I've had the privilege to meet uh, most of their senior professionals. And one person that has really stood out to me is Karen Carniel tambor uh, Thank you for joining us today, Karen. So great to be here, Alex. Thanks for having me. Why don't we dive into uh, the, the key topics that we're going to cover today. The first is inflation and interest rates. This is the, the big topic today. This is, you know, everybody's talking about it. Uh, second, we'll dive into, given the unique environment in which we live, how should investors think about investing? Uh, given this the current landscape. And then third, we'll move into the energy crisis, particularly in Europe, and uh, ESG investing. So inflation and interest rates. Um, obviously, we're highest inflation in 40 years. But it, I think if we zoom out a little bit, I think it's helpful to think in terms of long-term environments. So if you go back to 1982 all the way until 2008, it was basically one type of environment. We had falling interest rates, falling inflation, called disinflation. Then 2008 happened. We had the, you know, the global financial crisis. Until the COVID period, we had a, an environment of slow growth and massive stimulus. Um, and now there's a consideration of maybe we're at a new major inflection point. Uh, would you maybe t- describe how you see that? Uh, are we at a new inflection point, or is this just a blip and we're going to head back down towards that zero interest rate environment? I, I believe we really are at an inflection point where the years ahead will have a different inflationary backdrop to what happened since you know the 80s and you described it so well. And I think you can think about inflation as sort of having two waves. It has the secular pressure, what happens over decades of time, and those are slow moving, gradual pressures. And then there's the regular cyclical stock, which is obviously as the cycle goes up and down, that pressures inflation up and down. So it doesn't mean for a paradigm shift that you're not going to have ups and downs in inflation. For example, right now, you know, we just had uh, recently a uh, better CPI print that was lower because you do have some downward pressure of inflation that are cyclical. But from a secular perspective, I think it's kind of a hard break with what you've seen for so many years. And you just had a lot of pressures that were very deflationary, that were in the system and very slow moving. One way of thinking about those pressures is that a lot of decisions were able to be made by entities all around the world with the purpose of getting more efficient and reducing costs, right? So if you go and you outsource your workers to China and all of China comes online, 
you're spending money to literally make things cheaper. So globalization, outsourcing, all of these things, these were multi-year processes, multi-decade processes that kept lowering and lowering and lowering prices. And it was very efficient, productive. Companies were doing it because they would say, I want to move my costs over there because it will be cheaper. At the same time, you had this big win at the back of, you know, sort of less power for uh, employees, less labor unions, um, less anti-competitiveness regulation, less antitrust, more and more things that allowed price to keep coming down and more and more go into profits. Big, big, big forces in this direction. And what's happening today is you've kind of let this run its course. There aren't a lot of pressures that can keep lowering and lowering prices. One exception to that can be the pace of technological development, which, you know, while has been very deflationary for many decades, we don't really know what's going to happen as it going forward. But I think it's hard to believe that you're going to get the same kind of deflationary pressures from technology that you had over the last 40 years. If you just look at what technology was like, you know, in the 80s. Um, and at the same time, there are a lot of new pressures that are actually highly inflationary. And so I'll start with the ones that are just, you know, the flip side of uh, let's spend money, things like outsource. If you look at what companies want to spend money on today, usually there's not an impetus to say I'm spending money on something that I know is going to lower my cost. Companies are saying things like, I need my supply chain to be, be more resilient. What does that mean? That means I'm double doing my supply chain. I'm spending money on something that's not going to make me give you cheaper prices. I just need to because I'm worried about conflict. I'm worried about whether I can get to China. I'm worried about tensions like that. They're spending money on things like decarbonization, pressures to do so. That's long-term productive for the economy, but it certainly doesn't lower their costs tomorrow the way that you know outsourcing for cheaper labor does. And so you have these pressures to spend on defense, national security, decarbonization, goals that are main very word for society, but don't lower your um, prices automatically, don't lower your rents immediately, and become more inflationary than that. And then at the same time, the degree of what's happened to social pressures about that inequality Scott, where it has and whatnot means that power of labor is increasing again. You really can't get the same push in de-unionization that you had. You can't go from a lot of unions to zero again, because you're at zero, but you're going to get pressures the other way, both politically, um, in terms of what policymakers are doing, how they think about inequality. So there's a lot of inflationary pressures kind of built up, and it's coming out of a time that you've also generated, you know, a huge, huge, huge boom coming out of COVID that was engineered in a way that people literally got their money into their pockets. They could spend it extremely directly and create very strong demand. So those are very long-term pressures where pressures we had for so many years to get extremely low inflation, I think are just behind us. And now that we have heard on what the very least inflation is volatile. It's not just sort of stuff where it is never moves because when you start getting wage gains, they get sticky and then that gets passed on and so on and so forth. And so it's just very unlikely to me that you'll see another, you know, couple of decades of just very, very low, stable, sticky inflation that honestly just doesn't matter very much for investors. Uh, so w one of the questions that, that we're getting is, is what about all the debt that, you know, the U.S. economy is saddled with, you know, corporate government debt obviously has ballooned, um, household debt. And, you know, you look back over the last hundred years, we're at very high levels, debt to GDP. Um, what is that, what type of deflationary pressure does that pose? And how do we know that the inflationary secular trends that you just described outweigh you know, those deflationary pressures? Well, I think that the debt question is it is very real because the United States has gone from some degree of deleveraging. So a lot of the most over pockets are not there anymore, um, which, you know, sort of allows resistance dynamics to happen. But part of what's kept that under control, to be honest, is that the market hasn't believed yet that inflation is going to be a long-term problem. So if so you have high debt levels, right? The best thing that could possibly happen to you is if you have inflation today, but the market doesn't believe it'll be sustained. Because then what happens is, is that today your inflation kind of disappears. If you have 10% inflation a year, your debt becomes less and less important because that doesn't get, that's not getting uh, in the way. But typically that is to happen, especially in emerging markets, is that the markets say, wait a minute, 10% inflation a year, that means I have to charge that in interest rates. So if interest rates start rising, you can't roll over your debt. The long term, people expect demand to get paid back for the 10% inflation. 
they've kind of been in this like beautiful sweet spot where the deaths can keep falling because somehow interest rates don't actually rise in line with inflation. In other words, very negative real interest rates and the firm belief investors have that inflation, don't worry, it's going back to where it was, right? So the key question is, at the point where that turns and interest rates should really start rising and make it difficult to roll the debts and it become a problem for indebted entities in a way that hasn't happened materially yet, um, what are the indebted list levels going to be dead? And how levered are these entities helping if a deal is it that they run into a debt problem? And I think in the United States, the answer is, you know, not huge. We've had some real deleveraging and this period of high inflation without high interest rates has, you know, further brought the debt burdens down. So a lot of the most risky balance sheets are the best shape they've been in so many decades, despite the debt. That's not true everywhere around the world. And you see strains emerging in pockets of places, you know, Korea, China's deleveraging, places where there, there hasn't been a material deleveraging, where any rise in interest rates very quickly starts cutting into the problem that these are very indebted entities, they can't easily handle it. And I mean, that's basically what happened in 2008 in the United States. So we know that's great. We know what happens when you have a very over indebted economy, interest rates rise, not even that much, but that's just reached their limit, needs your reverse. It's not where the US is today anymore. Um, but depending on how fast the market decides that inflation is here to stay, it could become a problem. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. It, it's, it's, it, in some ways, it's kind of similar to the early 70s in that regard, right? With the, the view that inflation is transitory and maybe it lasts, uh, you know, for a prolonged period. Extremely similar. I think there's a lot of similarities because you go into the early 70s and it just, and there isn't a salient memory for investors of what that's like. And at the same time, no policymaker loves the idea of cutting off growth. And so if the market's not believing that inflation can be a big problem, you don't really want to cut off growth. What ends up happening is it takes a really long time to catch up with the reality of what inflation is. It doesn't happen in one go. The market just won't happen. If you look at the 70s, the thing you see in terms of being an investor is, first of all, it takes years and years where constantly bond markets price in less interest rate rises than actually occur. Cost for years and years. So it's not like inflation stars Markets get it. They say inflation is going to be high. That's it. You know, I'll adjust. Instead of that, it's like over and over and over again, markets expect not a deal, transitory. This is behind us. And then rates have to rise more than expected. And you still get a cycle. Slow goes up and down. But sometimes, you know, the Fed is too much. And they're like, oh, no, slow the economy. And you change their minds. It was less. They realize not slow as much as they wanted it to. It just takes time to realize that sort of new reality you're in. And then the second thing you see is, you know, equities are pretty much a disaster for reasons that are way bigger than what's going on with the actual earnings of the companies. Some companies can actually pass on that inflation to their customers, but the risk of premium you start demanding where inflation is volatile and that's the macroeconomic backdrop is just higher. Um, and so it's a very tough environment to be an investor. Yeah. So why don't we transition to how should investors think about investing given the backdrop that you just laid out? Particularly, the part to me that really stands out is for many years, actually decades, inflation was relatively stable. You didn't have big surprises to inflation for a long time, but growth surprised to the upside and downside constantly. Now you have volatility in both growth and inflation. So given, given the, the volatile uh, economic environment, um, how should, just generally speaking, how should investors think about investing in a period like this? Well, I couldn't agree more with what you're saying. That the key issue for investors is that we've all lived and invested through a period where inflation was not volatile and growth was very volatile. So that means that we've gotten used to what the relationships are like that are driven by growth. If you basically step out and say, what really drives the assets that you hold? There's only a few cross-cutting forces that hit everything. There's obviously a lot of idiosyncratic things that happen in any individual assets. I'm sure we'll talk about energy afterwards geopolitical things, but across all the assets you're holding, you know, the big thing that really matters is sort of what happens in the economy, both how fast is the economy growing or growth and how well prices or inflation, as well as sort of any future stream of um, cash flows, how are you discounting it today? So what's the interest rate and the discount at which you're discounting the cash flows and how much risk premium are you charging on those? So those are very, very few factors that cut across a lot of assets. And the thing can get confusing is that 
you live for so many years, like you just did, where inflation is a non-issue, you never see what relationships are between assets when inflation is high and low. And the most obvious example is stocks, bonds, where stocks and bonds have been such great diversifiers. When you think about it, the four factors I listed, actually three out of four stocks and bonds don't diversify. So if you want a higher risk premium on any assets you hold, same for stocks and bonds. Obviously high interest rates, bad for both. And inflation, pretty bad for both of them. Growth is the only thing that really makes stocks and bonds diversifying because when growth slows and you don't have an inflation problem, you can cut interest rates, bonds can rally, while stocks do bad and you just grow this well. And that pretty much is you know, one of four. That's just been the one thing that has really mattered. So suddenly see yourself in a place where stocks and bonds are not diversifying is a big shock, um, I think, for a lot of investors because we've just uh, we've lived through for several years and that's been kind of the most dominant relationship uh, that we've had for a long time. The other piece is just that I think a lot of the relationships we've looked at have been underpinned by whatever the experience was in the last 40 years and have just not been questioned. So another example I'll give is I hate a lot of people start thinking of um, emerging markets as kind of just like a higher beta version, a higher risk version of what we have elsewhere. But that's because the emerging markets, you know, acted in a certain way in the environment that we were in, not that they always have to be that way in the last, you know, year. Or so they haven't been because emerging markets have had a lot more inflation experience than us in the last 40 years. They were a lot more aggressive tightening into this and got less of a boot must cycle. It was less aligned with uh, the tactic you usually invested in because of their inflation experience. So it kind of requires revisiting what actually underpins the relationship between the asset that I'm used to. Um, and why do I think that's going to sustain in a period that is just fundamentally different than the period that we came out of previously? Yeah. And, and the, the part about what you just described that that really stands out to me in, in working with clients is it seems like there's a disconnect between what we, you know, investment prof professionals view as long term and the environments that play out versus what, what investors or clients think about. Uh, for us, you know, I, did, I just I started off by saying 1982 to 2008 was basically one environment. That's 26 years. Um, for most people, you know, one to three years is one environment. That was a long time. And so you could easily look at that and say, oh, this, this strategy worked for a long period of time as opposed to thinking of it in terms of, well, that was one environment in which it worked. In a very different environment, maybe it doesn't work. If you go back to the 1970s, I don't think 60-40 was even a topic because both the 60 and the 40 underperformed cash for a decade. I think that was more born out of the 80s and 90s bull market and stocks and bonds. So that that I think that's part of the reason why there's a disconnect. Does that does that make sense to you? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that um, you're totally right. It's it's a weakness in the fact that. Even if we have systemized decision making, what's emotionally salient to us is usually whenever we live through and a more recent experience is more emotionally salient. And so you just don't have a lot of investors alive today that invested in a period that is fundamentally different than what they have lived through. And as you're saying, three years can feel like a long time, especially when the roller coaster we just had with COVID, you know, it feels like we've been through five environments in a short period of time. But with a longer historical perspective and looking more broadly around the world, since 1980, it's been, you know, in some sense, one environment till COVID of deflation, lower and lower interest rates, continuous ability to stimulate. Sometimes you need to look in decades to see a real shift. What I would um, highlight is, you know, if you said to me, what's the single most important thing that really feels different um, in a larger perspective that is I wouldn't say it is central bank constraint. We have really not seen a time where central banks had any constraints to get what they wanted. And so they can go all out. And we're all really used to a place where we can say, if things go wrong, central banks can stab it. And I would say for any um, mix of assets that you're holding and kind of hoping to make risk premiums on over time, um, it's been a huge win in the back that every time things go wrong and the risk premiums start expanding and things start going down and have a wealth effect, central banks can say, let me go solve that problem. I don't want this problem. I'm not constrained. And that means they kept coming up with more and more creative tools to solve the problem. So you get interest rates, then you know you get the financial crisis, they say let's print money, 
And we all say, wow, printing money is really effective. Look at the impact that it had. You get 10 years out for printing money, and it's like, wait a minute, there are also downsides to printing money, which is printing money and buying bonds. That's like most financial markets, it's aspirating the quality. And COVID hits, they and really shift their paradigm again to say, okay, well, again, nothing's stopping us. COVID hit, we don't like this. We don't want a slowing economy. So let's come up with an even more creative tool and then revive the tool that hadn't existed in the war period, of basically saying, we're not only going to print money, we're going to work with the fiscal authorities to direct the people to need it. So we're going to print money and literally put it in people's pockets in different ways. In Europe, more by, you know, augmenting your paychecks and the US by just sending them checks views and uh we've called this monetary policy three or like third iteration of monetary policy after a great quantitative easing but all of this is under the assumption one environment which is central bank sees a problem solves it sees a problem solves it growth falls they can solve it and when we build um you know kind of our read of how constrained are central banks they just haven't been constrained a very long time until now now they look extremely constrained in most countries around the world, as constrained as they haven't looked since about the 70s, simple for reason that they want more than they can have. They want multiple things at once that just can't coexist. And so today, if growth slows, and I believe it will, it just tightened a lot. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me that growth won't slow because all this tightening is sort of coming down the pike. They're going to say, I don't like growth slowing. I have inflation and the full employment mandate. At the same time, inflation is not where I want it to be. Even if it falls from a cyclical perspective, it'll stay, I don't know, 4% or so, not their target. And now I have to choose, am I willing to keep hurting the economy to engineer a deeper recession, or am I willing to live with inflation that's higher than I wanted, knowing that we got out of control? So now I'm feeling really constraints. Now it's actually very hard. And uh, I've seen that happen first in places like Europe and the UK, where we talk about in the context of um, energy prices. But I think it'll increasingly happen in the U.S. as well. And we're not at the peak of it yet, right? Right now, the Federal Reserve is still seeing some pretty great growth numbers. So they're you know, not feeling kind of between a rock and a hard place. They're mostly seeing an inflation problem. But I think we're going to get in a spot where they just can't have everything they want at once. And what that means for an investor is that sort of the savior is not there anymore. It's so akin for us to do terribly for a long period of time because Central banks just can't get all the things that they want at once. That's probably the biggest change in what the environment is like, and really something we haven't seen in quite a few decades. Yeah, one of the one of the questions that, I, that I'm getting here is the 60-40 framework is the conventional portfolio. And obviously that allocation doesn't have any inflation hedges in it. Um, how, how can investors who use 6040 as a reference point because that's what they've been used to the last couple of decades. How do they practically make changes to their portfolio to account for some of the risks that you described earlier? Well, you said it totally right. 6040, the biggest problem with it is that both stocks and bonds don't do well when inflation rises. I always say I think the easiest thing investors can do if you're starting on a 6040 reference point is just change some of your novel loss of inflation because you're already comfortable having bonds. And what you know is that if inflation prints exactly what's expected today, if CPI prints of value what's expected, you're going to make the same. You're going to break even. It's going to make no difference whether you are an inflation-linked bond or an animal bond, you'll make the same. And when you look at what is that break-even level, it's all break-even inflation, it's not very high inflation. And so if you just make that switch, you pretty much will make the same amount of money if inflation is what's expected to be, which is pretty tame. And because above that, You'll just get paid out whatever CPI is holding those inflation and bond. So to me, that's probably the easiest switch that can be done in the context of starting on 6040. Say, listen, I'm just going to take some of my bonds and make sure they just pay me out whatever CPI is because that way I just don't want to get paid inflation. I can't kind of, you know, a problem that inflation comes out, I'm going to spend on my bonds. That doesn't mean that you're immune to anything in this environment. Still, is still to have cash flows that could fall in value just like other bonds, but You'll break even away or any hole if inflation is as tame as sort of expected. And then the more challenging thing is starting to think about inflation hedges that you know are either leaning more into commodity producing equities to so you're getting the more direct pass through of one of the parts of the economy that are most likely to have inflation, going more directly into um redenominating issues like gold. And that's where, you know, in this trickier is gonna be a little further investment mandates. 
and you do start getting questions of, well, what are all the ways inflation can show up in the economy and go on and be concentrated one or the other and you want to have broad exposure? You know, it is, it is pretty remarkable that I'm sure inflation is one of the most Google terms now in finance. And, and, and that's talked about, it's the highest inflation in 40 years. It's the biggest concern of central bankers. Um, and yet there aren't many inflation hedges in portfolios, at least the portfolios that I see. So there's a lot of talk about high inflation and concerns about inflation, but investors, generally speaking, aren't doing much about it in terms of their allocation. And at the same time, markets are discounting inflation to go from you know, eight or 9% that we have today down to two and change uh, next year which seems very optimistic. So it, it is interesting how there is that disconnect. Absolutely, and I think it's because it's, uh, as an investor, more comfortable sometimes to buy assets that have gone on recently rather than ones that are well-valued precisely because they haven't. So if you take the example, I know I've heard of inflation with bonds. If the markets would have already said, look, obviously this inflation is here to stay and it's not going anywhere, right? And break-even inflation would already be really high. In other words, interest rates have risen a lot, and you'd say, well, I don't really know if I break even between holding an nominal bond and inflation linked bond, pretty high inflation that's already expected. But precisely because the market hasn't done that, you haven't seen any good performance. It's not like to be so much money holding these bonds. So there isn't any performance chasing that's going in there, but that means that that pricing is actually right to be able to pay you if that mean does change uh, going forward. Um, I totally agree with you. It's just the fact that for you know so many years, inflation has been a non-issue, so it just hasn't been high on people's list of what to look for. So, so let's let's zoom in a little bit on this tightening environment. You, you alluded to it a little bit earlier. So you've had rapidly rising interest rates. So the risk-free rate just you know went from zero, and it's heading towards five percent or so based on market discounting. Um, and so all assets face a material headwind during that environment. So why should investors even take risk in a period like this? Why, why shouldn't they just put their money in a money market, get whatever that risk-free yield is, and then wait until the tightening ends? Is there is there a reason to stay fully invested in an environment like this? Yeah, I think the hardest thing as an investor is separating your confidence in what the environment will be like, um, not taking too big of a bet based on your read of conditions. Because you know, I, I look at Bridgewater and be have 45 years of experience, a lot of um, really deep research that we're building on, um, a very long track I heard. The reality is any view we have is, I don't know, 55% likely to be right. And when you look at what it's like to just go and get under invest, just go to cash, especially if you have a balanced portfolio, very, very hard to time that well. And that is just one investment bet, just like any other investment bet would be, that you to be world class and have fifty five percent chance of being right. It's very very hard not to leave money on the table if you are you know um, trying to meet that sort of timing. Um, so for most investors, I'd say you just want to be thoughtful about how big of a battery willing to take. That you know you sort of know what the environment will like so confidently you want to put money on the table. Now I do think it is a really good time to allocate towards more alpha because of the concern about the environment in the sense that if you think you have access to time in the market, now's a good time to you know be looking at uh, doing that, especially if you'll be good in this environment. But just going to cash, very, very hard to time well, and it's just one of any of you, so you don't want to over-dominate your portfolio with that. I'll say, yes, it is definitely um, been one of the worst times we've seen to be invested in assets. And... Um, Going forward, I don't think it looks great, but it also looks in some sense less bad than it did because a lot of assets already have repriced. And so if you look at where the interest rates are, you know, to get another move that's as bad for assets as the one we just got, you'd have to get a move as big, a tightening as big in interest rates. Um, and that seems less likely to me while possible, and you don't want to come anyone and you dominate your views. Um, you did just get such a big historic move that to hurt all assets as much as you just hurt them in this year of 2022 would be hard to do. That said, any individual asset can definitely be hurt that much. This is why you don't want to be constant. So I'll give the example of just stocks and bonds, which is I just think stock and bond pricing can't coexist, right? They just can't coexist. Because to me, either inflation will not come down as much as expected, in which case 
you're going to have to go and like engineer a slowdown. So equities will have to fall. In other words, growth will have to be weaker and will have to have a much bigger earnings slowdown than currently expected. And equities will do badly. Or, you know, the founders will say, don't worry, I'm not going to hurt the economy, but I will live with higher inflation, which gives you a really bad high for bonds because more inflation will get priced in um, that currently is expected to go away. It seems impossible to me that both magically inflation goes away and at the same time, you don't have any kind of slowdown. Like, it doesn't seem like that could possibly work based on many decades of economic history. You need an economic slowdown to get the place to come down as much as expected in uh, bond markets. And so if you look at that, you say, okay, well, stock and bond pricing can coexist. So I can have my view of which one of them's more likely to be right. What I really don't want to mean is overly concentrating one asset, which is usually people equities. If I have a more balanced portfolio, now my risk is more something structural, like the sole um, path of interest rate changing, like happened in 2022. And while that could happen again, happening as badly as it did in 2022 seems a lot less likely because it's been such a spark of lower than the bar. Uh, why don't we transition to our third topic of the energy crisis, uh, particularly in Europe and ESG investing in general? Um, obviously, Europe is facing very weak growth, the highest inflation in decades. Uh, how do you? How do you see them coming out of this crisis? Well, I think for Europe, they um, had a structural shock in competitiveness that in some sense you don't quote come out of. Like, even if you get through this winter, you still are at a place where it's just going to be more expensive to produce things in Europe because energy prices will stay higher in Europe than elsewhere. So certain industries are just not going to be as competitive in Europe as they were prior to this. And it's not that different than say the UK going through Brexit where you realize that's a shock. That's a material change over medium to long term in terms of what's competitive in the UK economy. Um, those are very tough shocks for central banks to deal with because it's a real shock to the productive sort of capacity um, of the economy. So in that sense, I don't think Europe is quote coming out. I think the great thing that's happening here is that this is helping Europeans realize, wait a minute, all of this energy stuff it takes real time and planning. You can't just sort of cut it off, turn it on. You need to think through incentives and planning through uh, many years and decades. And Europe is very, very, very committed to say we should decarbonize. They're very, very, very committed to say we should climate change. And what that means is that in the near term, they might have to use whatever energy comes their way, right? Shortage. But medium to long term, they're realizing that means we have to plan we have to set ourselves up to have the kind of energy supply that we want for many years to come, starting today. Um, where are we going to bake in the cake? You know, energy really does get baked in the cake when you're in these crises, right? Like when supply is tight and you have a problem, that's where there's incentive to go invest. And the question is, what are you investing in to bring online in the next decade or two based on the pricing today? And so I think Europe is pairing well to say, let's put all the incentives in place to basically build the pattern and just want for many years ahead rather than be stuck in this problem over and over again. The thing that is, again, really tough is that in the United States, we're not really dealing with kind of painful stagflation. In Europe, it's very literal stagflation because you're getting higher energy prices and it doesn't matter how high they go, you just literally can't ration enough to get enough energy to power the economy. So by definition, the economy has to slow and prices are going to go on. Stagflation, rising prices and falling growth at the same time is this crisis. Um, and so that's a very huge short-term problem that, you know, then is hopefully spurred in the medium to long-term thoughts of how do we build the kind of energy system that we want. Yeah. So on, on that train of thought, if we were to zoom out a little bit and you look at how humanity is trying to tackle climate change, uh, what's your sense about, you know, generally speaking, what are we getting right? What are we getting wrong? Well, wow. the hardest thing is that humanity is obviously not coordinated. It's not one thing. And you see this in things like COP. I mean, these are lots of players, each with their own interests. It's not like there's some business plan for humanity to get out of this. And that means that by definition, it's not ever going to be some smooth path, right? Because it's not like there's one plan that powers it all that kind of bring it all together and it makes sense. Um, and so you should sort of expect that it's going to be messy and, and chaotic. I think the biggest problem was how it's been approached is that in some sense, it was easier to put some pressures in place that led to having 
an energy supplied problem. And so the example is, is it's easier for investors to say, well, I don't want to finance coal anymore. That doesn't mean that you're making sure that you are financing greener energy to replace that coal on the other side. It means you're not financing coal. Um, so you've had a lot of the efforts on Kirby climate change be ones that kind of shut off certain energy sources without necessarily contributing what's coming out the other end at the same time. And then because policymakers are not coordinated and not on policy takes a very long time, you also get like a paralysis of not knowing where policy is going. You see the United States really clearly with other energy companies saying, I just don't understand where regulation is going. It's a little better after the latest that Biden built. I'm just not going to invest in any direction because I'm not sure what incentives are going to be set up here. So you get this paralysis. Meanwhile, that's another case where you just don't have enough coming online. So even before Russia ever invaded Ukraine, you are setting up the situation where you've had underinvestment for a really long time in energy for a combination of factors. And some of that have to do with how fire change can tackle some of them or other factors I can talk about. But you kind of set yourself up to say there just won't be enough energy, which then, of course, causes prices to go up and causes inflationary pressure can't get on us. And the biggest problem with that is that then what you take from that is, okay, well, I just can't even solve climate change anymore because I can't think about this and I got to solve my energy problem, right? So you kind of lose looks on the goal. Stepping back, I think you're basically saying, look, there's a two broad ways to solve um, the fact that we need to rely less on fossil fuels. You could make the fossil fuels more expensive, tax them, make them really discouraged in some way or another, or you could take the things you want instead and basically put carrots around them, make them really attractive and so on and so forth. And the classic economist answer has always been, of course, just tax the thing you don't like, right? It can have pollution. And you have this polluting thing that it's full cost and not being sort of priced in, um, just put the cost on. And then the market will adjust and quote the most efficient way. And while that's theoretically really beautiful, it's never been politically popular. And I think in an environment of rising inflation, it becomes completely impossible. Because you already have rising inflation, you're going to add taxes and increase the price further, things that are already expensive. That seems very unlikely. So I think that the smart shit that we see happening, especially in the United States and Biden's bill, but also elsewhere, um, is to say, okay, especially in this inflationary environment, we have to go incentivize the things you want. We have to go say, let's make the playing field at least even, because we currently some sort of a lot of fossil fuels, but ideally more than even, ideally to go and say, here are all the incentives we're going to give you to go move towards the stuff that we'd like to see over time. Um, and I think that's going to be you know, kind of our best path. And that may take some time, I assume. Absolutely, because a lot of these things take many years to come online. They're not something you can kind of just flip a switch. And um, investors, I think, have to be practical and thoughtful about what kind of transition do you want that makes sense. Like an example I always give is that when you look at natural gas, a lot of the piping, the physical piping of natural gas, can then later be transitioned to even greater forms of energy. And so being religious to say natural gas is not perfect, it's not very helpful if you're saying actually going from coal to natural gas can be a hugely helpful step with already but a lot less efficiency to do with coal. And then you can actually reuse a lot of that infrastructure when you go even greener later on. So, you know, you kind of have to be thoughtful about where are we going at a multi-year time and how long it takes to you know, build out the infrastructure. And we've gone back to the discussion of, you know, kind of how the paradigm shift, uh, We've got to do so a world where like Instagram gets screened as a company and like with a couple of employees and very, very quickly our world is different. And that's not how the physical infrastructure works. That's just not how physical infrastructure works. And so these are much longer investment cycles and choices we make. And once you think something and take them out, I get another example I give a lot, which is if you want to actually switch to things like electric vehicles and solar panels and so on, you need to source all the physical materials to make them. And it's not like you can just, you know, flip a switch and you have all the copper in the world. Like starting a mine takes time and you have to actually set it up. And so if you underinvest in some of these things, all the desires in the world won't help you. People literally can't make, you know, physical materials you need to, to, to your transition. And some of these need many, very long lead times. And there isn't a central planner in the world. And so it takes, you know, thoughtful incentives.
I have one final question. Um, there's obviously been a proliferation of ESG strategies and indexes. Um, in your view, what are some of the biggest flaws you're seeing with the way these are constructed? Wow. Well, sometimes I want to say don't get me started, but no, I think that look, it's a it's a it's an industry in its infancy in some sense, and so you're going to see the natural evolution of um, things uh, involving um, from simple to more complex, sophistication rising, and so on and so forth. But I'd say the early iteration, you saw a lot of things being titled DSG that were so similar to their original index, you have to squint to see any possible difference. And so, you know, you could call when you want, but in my view, if you're not changing what you're holding at all, I don't know if you deserve a special label, you know? And so that's, that's shifting through time. I'm getting more sensitive to saying, if I think I care where my money still is going to be in the exact same place. What could that possibly mean? Um, and then now, I think one of the weaknesses is that um, there's been such a focus on supporting governments in their attempt to get to net zero and reduce emissions. But there can be confusion about what it means to do that in a portfolio context. And I'll give you one extreme example, which is there's still a lot of companies in the world that don't have much to do with emissions, like amazing companies that make medicines. They don't naturally emit very much carbon. They don't pollute very much. Obviously, they're connected to electricity, but they don't really control exactly what electricity source they get to use. They're just not that connected to the problem. So if you just said, I just want to hold my portfolio with lots of companies that are have nothing to do with climate change, you can have amazing numbers on emissions, but you're not really related to the problem at all. You've just sort of avoided it and gone into parts of the economy that don't have to do with it. And so anything that's a simplistic let me just tell you one number, like, let me tell you your final emissions number. It might be kind of self-defeating related to what goals are. So my, my general thought is, I think investors are honing their understanding of what are my goals? What am I really trying to do? And financial products are being created in response that are going to get more sophisticated as they better understand what are these investors are trying to do and what can I engineer that actually truly meets the goals that they have. Karen, you've been very generous with your time. I appreciate uh, all your insights. Uh, I enjoyed the conversation. I hope our listeners did as well. So thank you for thank you for being here.